Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in the words, in wisdom, in compassion, in song, let us feel your presence. We are never without that presence. It is allowing that presence to overwhelm us that makes us who we are and who we can be. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. Please be seated. Again, it is a privilege. I'd like to pick up again with one part of this again. And it is the place where Jesus is talking to Nathaniel. Nathaniel, in his wonder, has had those unkind words, can anything good come out of Nazareth? You know, when I was a kid, and we were uh, playing a school that was away, we were Glen Glenelg High School in Maryland, and we were playing Howard High, which was our big rival. And I remember kind of saying something, can anything good come out of Howard High? <laughs> and I think that we kind of have that. But here is what Nathaniel says. He said, again, Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You shall see greater things than that. And then he said, I tell you the truth. You shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the sun of of man. That's quite a promise. You will see God breaking into the world. You'll see it coming up and down. You'll see heaven open, says Jesus to Nathaniel. Now Nathaniel is a follower. And he leads a parade. These people in this scripture and sisters and brothers, we're in that parade. That's the gift. To be a disciple is to follow. To look at the sacredness of God breaking into the world through the mundane. The story was wonderful. Thank you for the children's time. It's when you least expect it. Think of what Nathaniel really saw. He saw what the world looked like as an itinerant preacher who got caught in a political struggle and was nailed to a cross. Well, what the disciples saw and what we see is that when love is nailed to a cross and is so much a part of the power of God, that, that behind that you're always going to see a manger in a stable. You're going to see behind that a man on a cross, but behind all of that, you're going to see an open tomb. And life wrestled out of death. And then as disciples, we follow that way. We live that way. And we don't wait only for the grim reaper. We see life wrestled out of the throes of death and destruction every day. I have that privilege being a part of Food for the Poor now after some 40-some years of being in active parish ministry. And I'm coming here to tell you about a mission and a ministry that I think is up your block and down your alley as I look at this congregation. Down your alley, I know. Well, that's pretty good. <laughs> Not too bad, huh? By the way, I really do think it is magnificent what you have done with this. Food for the Poor tries to look at the most vulnerable people and know, just as the children's sermon said, Jesus breaks into our world through the most vulnerable, allowing us to use these magnificent gifts that we dare even call our own for those who are most vulnerable. And Jesus not only identifies, he says, whenever you have done it for any one of the least of these, my children, you know the rest of it, what does it say? You have done it for who? Yeah, you've done it for me. With food for the poor, I want to tell you about the marvelous history of this. It's been 35 years. And in that 35 years, we have become blessed to be the largest relief and development organization 
that is located in the United States of America. The headquarters is down at Coconut Creek, right around the block from here. Well, a few hours down the block, I guess. But we have been able to do that because we are a group of people. I'm asking you if you would like to be a part of it. I'm not really asking you exclusively for money, but I am going to ask you for your heart, and Jesus tells me how to get that. So I want to say to you, I want to invite you to be a part of an adventure, an adventure that is called Food for the Poor, and tries to reach out and care. We have been in 35 years now working, and it's an interdenominational group. Lutherans, both branches, you thought the Age of Miracles was over? <laughs> Episcopalians, Roman Catholics, Methodists, United Church of Christ. We're all in this together. And we work with the 35, excuse me, 17 countries around the Caribbean area. I kind of think of us as uh, the Kentucky Fried Chicken of ministries. We do one thing and do it real, real well. We don't try to go around the world. Now, I want to say to you, I support Lutheran World Relief because I think the presence in Syria, in Africa, and those things are very important. I look at food for the poor in the way that story in the scriptures talks about Lazarus, the Lazarus at the door. You know, it's the one that's right on our doorstep. It's a lot easier for me to get down to Haiti right now than it would to get to Harrisburg, South Dakota, let me tell you. But this is right on our doorstep. And we take those 17 countries around there. Plus, right now, we've added in a place that we normally don't go, and that's Puerto Rico. We understand something about solar energy. We understand something about having to cook outside, and we have those kind of stoves. So we're reaching in and trying to do what we can do. And we're, this is not our normal bailiwick. But again, that storm wasn't normal either, was it? So, but I want to tell you that that's where we can go. Now, let me say some other things to you. I know that coming across your doorstep every time and in your mail and also on your phones are all kinds of people who are bringing a charity and understanding to you. But I want to say to you about food for the poor, I think in our world it is as easily donor beware as it is buyer beware and probably even more so. I want to tell you this, and I want you to hear this, because I know you're going to be good stewards. You're working with a consecration Sunday that's coming up. By the way, I want to congratulate your leaders on it. I think this is one of the best styles of letting the giver know their need to give. And it really is. I applaud this for you. But as stewards, you should turn around and ask me, OK, with these God-given gifts that I dare even call my own, what are you doing? And I want to tell you, we use 4.44 cents out of every dollar for all administration and fundraising, meaning more than 95 cents out of every generous gift that you give. Your generosity then reaches out and feeds people, 2 million people every single day. I want to say that again, 2 million people every single day in Jesus' name. You know this statement about Nathaniel? And Jesus comes to him and he says, you were impressed because I saw you under a fig tree? You're going to see angels up and down. Well, one of the marvelous miracles that Nathaniel saw when he sat there was when Jesus took a little boy's lunch, a couple of fish, some barley loaves, Blessed him, fed 5,000 people. 5,000 people. Folks, here, I want to tell you something. When you become a part of Food for the Poor, and I hope you will, every single day you're going to feed 2 million people in Jesus' name. Greater things you have done in my name, says Jesus, than even I have done. Is that not marvelous? And we can do it for six cents a meal. Six cents. It's rice. It's beans. It's also tilapia or poultry. Trying to feed people. We want to do basically three kinds of things with people. First of all, we want to feed them to make them be alive. Two, we would like to educate them. Because 
You can't take away a mind. And then the last thing we really want to do for people is teach them how to make a profit. You don't hear that often said, but it's a way to create an economy for people to feel a self-worth, for somebody to take the money and educate their children and buy their food and put up a house and feel creative and a part of it all. That's what we're doing in Jesus' name. Every single day in Jesus' name for those who are impoverished right on our doorstep. There have been a lot of things said about Haiti recently. And I guess I want to say I've been there and I want to tell you a story about it. And I want to tell you a story about food for the poor and the wonderful people just like yourself who decided to be food for the poor and be generous. We can build a home in Haiti. We can build it for $3,600. Now, I want to tell you something. That's really only half of it, because we're matched dollar for dollar in putting that up. So it's $7,200 that really puts it up. What's the house like? Well, in this last storm, we were biting our fingernails a lot because our houses were meant to withstand 125 mile an hour winds. That's a good blow, right? My house up in Orange City, Florida, it really is built to withstand 125 mile an hour winds. They came in and over Haiti at 145. Oops. Since the great earthquake, we've built over 10,000 homes in Haiti alone. And we're worried. They were built to be 125. Good news, we lost 411 roofs. That's it. The houses stood. We've retrofitted the others. We put the roofs on a couple days, and we're back in. You can do that. I want to tell you that my wife and I, over the years, just were giving gifts and working it. And if you would like to do about $200 a month, or you as a congregation were to maybe look at a part of your Lenten project and say you want to do that, you know, here's another thing that I love. When Connie and I get together to do our devotions, we have a picture of the Rodriguez family from Guatemala. And they're there, and we can look at them. I've never met them. But they're living in the home that, by the grace of God, we were able to build. You know, would you like to have a residence of spirit of joy? South. You could do it. You got beautiful walls out there, pictures. You'd have a picture of a family who's there. Maybe individually you'd like to do it. It's a wonderful way to create a home for someone who maybe in your mind, in your memory, created a home for you, created what you were. $200 a month, year and a half, kind of where it boils down to, or whatever way. Now let me tell you a story. I was in Haiti. We were building these houses. And they were on track. Most of the houses that we were going into, because they were just being finished, and again, we train people how to build the houses. And then we pay them for building the houses. And then they go out and create the economy. You know, relief is give a man a fish. Developments teach him how to fish. Create an economy. That's a part of what's going on. So the houses were being built. We were watching them. And in Haiti, it's concrete houses with rebars in there and the metal roofs that are on the top. So we were seeing a couple, and they were impressive. Now, there was a family that had moved in. Now, we had all of our shoes full of Haiti on it, and we were not really ready to walk into somebody's home. But there was this marvelous little boy. He was dressed in blue pants and a white shirt, which are the colors of our schools. We build schools like there are no tomorrow. And when you are in one of our houses, if you have children, and everybody has children, then you go to one of our schools. Schools are not free. But this is a way we can do it. And the house has a roof, again, now that will withstand 145 miles an hour. We learned. Concrete walls. You are, then have the plumbing in there so that you no longer have to go outside to take a shower. 
and you're not vulnerable and exposed. So this is the kind of house we've seen this. Now there are 12 or 13 of us, this little boy standing on earth. He's got a little kitten in his arm. He was taking very good care of this little kitten. Almost you could see in his eyes, you've taken good care of me. I want to pass this on. And he's motioning to us to come to his house, and we're thinking, ah, you know? But his mother's there, come, come, come. She's got a broom, she'll clean it all up. We walked in, and they were so delighted to see us and thank us. The little boy grabbed me by the hand, took me over to his desk. Now we have a solar panel that's on top of this house. It's enough electricity so the children can do their homework. And he wanted to show me his books and what he was learning. You could just see in his eyes the excitement of it. And you know, I don't know exactly what his future will be. But I have a gut feeling that because of the love of Christ working through good people who are food for the poor, just like yourselves, it's going to be marvelous. We went from there. We saw tilapia ponds that they were building. Again, you remember, created economy as well. There were 58 tilapia ponds producing 158 tons of tilapia every year between El Salvador and Haiti. Now, went there and a man walked in and he was about this tall. I've got to admit to you, by this time I had made a fatal mistake of brushing my teeth with the regular water, so mm, I wasn't doing real well, but I was impressed. The man walked in and he had all kinds of, he was from, he was from Auburn University. He was a PhD ichthyologist and he was putting this up and working this and he had his students who were there, his grad students. His story is this, he has absolutely no idea who his biological parents are because as an infant he was placed on the doorstep of one of our orphanages. We were able to educate and we will educate people to the degree to which they can go and we were able to get him through PhD. And now he was coming back and forth from Auburn University and bringing his students to develop this. This was his care for his people. He was not willing to sit in the United States alone, but was going back and forth to raise this community of people. I saw doctors, I saw nurses, people who were educated from Haiti in the United States through Food for the Poor who were back home lifting these people. That's the kind of folks that we are working with. That's the kind of people that we need to help so that the rising tide lifts all boats. It's an adventure in faith. On the way in, if everything worked well, received this. And on it, you see, that's what China. I want to tell you something else. If you see a picture of a child or something, don't think that we just take a picture, walk off, say good day. We only take a picture of somebody we know we're going to work with from then on. She's doing well. She's four there. This is four years old. She's eight now. But I want to say to you, this is accordion type deal. You take with China, and you go over here, and you tear that. Well, it's an envelope. I'll be at the back door. You can tell I'm a shy kind of guy. I'll be the one lying down across the door. You just step over me to get out. <laughs> you can also take it home. And you're the kind of crowd that also, if you look under this, uh, where they had the little girl with that white goat, and you see you can text the word kindness to 51555, and you can donate online if you're so in inclined. Me, I have a checkbook. You know, I'm that vintage kind of guy. But I want to tell you, it's one of those adventures in faith. And it's the kind of thing, you know, when the person knocks on the door, that is Jesus. I guess I'm knocking on your door. I'm a beggar for the beggars. That's who I am. Didn't Luther say the church is one beggar finding, tell another beggar where to find bread? So I'm there for you. Thank you for this privilege.
And I thank you that you exist down here, and I'm fairly close to you. You might see me drifting in here. I live a pretty far piece. It wouldn't be a weekly kind of thing, but I'll be around again. I, I like your style. Now I'm going to ask you to do the last thing. It's going to be the hardest thing, and that is close your eyes and not fall asleep. All right? I want you to use your imagination. I want you to see out in front of you now a whole panoply of people just sitting there on the ground, picnic style, eating. And you can tell immediately by their attire that they're not wealthy at all. But there's a happy murmur. And every so often they look up and you see them and they're smiling at you. And then you see somebody in the middle start to rise slowly, majestically. He has a hood over his head, he pushes it back. And his eyes look into your eyes, into your heart, into your soul. And you know immediately who it is. And he says to you, come. Come to the kingdom prepared for you before the beginning of time. Because when I was hungry, it was you, it was you who gave me food. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Can we hear from Pastor Berger? Um, the truth is, we are on the cusp of a stewardship campaign. And it, it is probably, um, you may be thinking, why, why are we bringing more ministries in when we, you know, we got to think about facilities, we got to think about all these things. The truth is, we have our leadership team, our, our finance team, our uh, leadership team, all working really hard to, to figure out what, is, what does it look like to um, re-envision how we do budgeting, what we do with the resources, with the blessings God has given us. And like I said before, it's incredibly important to see what ministries we can partner with on this, how we can constantly be looking outside these doors. Because the second we become too inward focused, we, we, be, we no longer become the church. We're just a social club that are trying to keep our, 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 our building going.